This is a quick revision of topic 4, AQA, GCSE, Chemistry, a Chemical Change. Reactivity series. The metals are placed in order of reactivity, which can help predict their reactions. So the reactivity series will arrange the, the metals in order of their reactivity towards different substances. The reactivity of metals is determined by how easy they can lose electrons to form the positive ions. So the metals at the top of the reactivity series are the most reactive. They can easily form the positively charged ions and the ones at the bottom are the least reactive. So in the reactivity series, you can notice that there is carbon and hydrogen added to the reactivity series, which are not metals. They are non-metals. They are added for two reasons, because metals which are less than carbon or below carbon in the reactivity series are less reactive than carbon. And that means that carbon can replace the metal from their salts and then it can be used to extract the metal from their ores. And also we have hydrogens. Metal above the hydrogen in the reactivity series are more reactive than hydrogen, which means they can actually react with acids, while metals which are below hydrogen are less reactive and will not react with acids. To memorize the order of the metals in reactivity series, we're going to use a simple trick. So the first three elements will be found from group one elements because group one elements are the most reactive of all the metals. And we know that as we're going down the group, the reactivity will increase. So potassium, sodium and lithium are added at the, as the first three elements or the first three metals in the reactivity series. Then that's followed by group two elements elements which are less reactive than group 1 elements. Again, as we go down the group, the reactivity increases. So calcium will come before magnesium. And then we will have group 3 elements, which is aluminium. After that, we're going to find the carbon. At the bottom of the reactivity series, we can find some of the transition metals, which are much less reactive. So we're going to find copper, silver, gold, and platinum. In the middle, you're going to find a mix of other elements from different groups, from different uh, metals from different groups. And we just need to memorize this order of the zinc, iron, tin, and lead. Reaction examples of reactions of metals will include the reactions of metals with the acids. So some metals will react with acids to give hydrogen and salt. And the acid here refers to cold and dilute acid. They are not hot, hot and concentrated one. We can use the reactivity series to predict the reactivity of different metals with acid. So the speed of the reaction here is indicated with the rate at which the hydrogen gas is produced. So the number of bubbles uh, can give us an indication of how fast or the rate of the reaction. So very reactive metals, the one at the top of the reactivity series, like potassium sodium, lithium, and calcium will react explosively and they will produce a lot of hydrogen. And then less reactive metals like magnesium, zinc, and iron will react less violently. Metals which are below <clears throat> hydrogen in the reactivity series will not react with cold dilute acids, but they can react with hot acids or with the concentrated acid. Example of that is copper. So copper can react with hot acids to give salt and hydrogen as well. These are some uh, examples of the writing um, re uh, reaction between balanced equation between metals and acids. Another example of reactions between metals uh, for metals that can show the different reactivity of metals towards other substances is the reaction of metals with water. We can also use the reactivity series to uh, predict the rate of the reaction. So some metals will react with water to give metal hydroxide and hydrogen. So water and metal will give metal hydroxide and hydrogen. The speed of the reaction is also determined by the rate of producing of the hydrogen ion, uh, hydrogen um, gas that is produced from the reaction. The more reactive the metal, the faster the reaction. So very reactive metals like so, uh, potassium, sodium, lithium, and calcium will react with water to give the hydroxide and the hydrogen, while less reactive ones like zinc, iron, and copper will not react with water. 
this is some of the uh, balanced equation for reaction between metals and water. This topic only also cover the oxidation and reduction um, topic, which is the redox reaction. So what is oxidation and reduction? We can define oxidation and reaction using two terms. The first one is the gain and loss of oxygen. So we can define oxidation by gaining of oxygen. So for example, gaining oxygen, magnesium can be oxidized to make magnesium oxide because magnesium gained an oxygen. And also we can define reduction by the loss of oxygen. So reduction, for example, which is loss of oxygen, we can, an example of that is a copper oxide when it's reduced to give copper metal. So copper oxide with carbon will give you the copper metal and carbon dioxide. So in this reaction, the copper oxide, the copper has been reduced because it lost an oxygen. Why do we call it redox reaction? Because normally for any oxidation reaction, when there is an oxidation, there must be a reduction that is taking place at the same time. So this is why we call this redox reaction, because there is oxidation and reduction uh, taking place at the same time. Redox, the other definition of the redox or of oxidation and reduction, a more wider uh, definition is the loss and gain of electrons. So oxidation can be defined as loss of electrons and reduction can be defined as gain of electrons. So how would we write the redox equation? How can we determine whether a certain element has been oxidized or reduced in a certain reaction? So reaction of metals with an acid is one of the examples of redox reaction. So if you have iron reacting with hydrogen chloride to give you iron chloride and hydrogen gas, the Iron here will be oxidized because it lost two electrons to give iron um, ion, iron 2 plus, and the hydrogen, which um, is a hydrogen plus from hydrogen chloride, and it has changed to hydrogen uh, gas, it has been reduced because it gained electron. So now we can write the half equation for iron. So the iron, the half equation, we can show that iron has changed into iron two plus with the loss of two electrons, while the hydrogen, two hydrogen ions gained two electrons to give the hydrogen gas. And then the ionic equation will include all the elements or all the ions that have been changed uh, in the equation. So without the use of the electrons, because they canceled each each other out. Remember that in these in the ionic equation, we don't add any ions that hasn't been changed in the reaction. They are called the spectator ions, like chloride in this example. Another example is the halogen displacement reaction. So we learned before that the more reactive halogens will displace the less reactive ones from their salts. And as we go down in the group seven, which are the halogens, we're gonna find that the reactivity will decrease. So chloride will be, chlorine is more reactive than bromine. So chlorine can displace the chlor uh, bromine from its salt. So an, um, an example of this reaction is chlorine with potassium bromide to give you bromine and potassium chloride. This is a redox reaction Well, chlorine was reduced as the two chlorine atom in chlorine gained two electrons to give you two chloride ions, while bromide and the potassium bromide has been oxidized because it lost two electrons to give bromine. So half ionic equation for bromide and for chlorine can be written like this. And then the ionic equation is chlorine plus two bromide will give you to chloride and bromine. Remember that the potassium here is the spectator ion and it's not included in the ionic equation. A third example is the metal displacement reaction. In the same way as halogens displaces the less reactive ones from their salts, also metals which are more reactive will displace the less reactive metals from their salts. So from the reactivity series, we know that iron is more reactive than copper. So iron can displace copper from its salt to if so if you react iron 
uh, with a copper sulfate that will give you iron sulfate and the copper metal. This is a redox reaction. The iron has been oxidized because it lost electron to give you the iron uh, ion, and also the copper has been reduced because it gained to uh, it gained electrons to electrons to give you the copper element. And this is the ionic equation. The sulfate ion is the spectator ion. Moving on to talk about metals on Earth and how can we uh, extract metals from their ores. So metals on Earth do not um, exist in pure form, but they usually very reactive and they tend to react with oxygen and form oxides. These are called the metal ores. And to extract the metals from their ores, we need to um, use one of two methods. So formation of the ores and the extraction of metals these are redox reaction or oxidation reaction. So formation of metal ores is a type of oxidation where there is a gain of oxygen, like magnesium or oxygen will give you magnesium oxide. And the reaction that separates the metal from its oxide is a reduction reaction because there is a loss of oxygen here. So copper oxide with copper with uh, carbon will give you the copper element and carbon dioxide where there is a loss of oxygen. So extraction of metal um, when we look at the reactivity series we can determine the way of extracting the metal from its ore so if the metals are below the carbon in their activity series then they can be extracted from their ores by reduction using the carbon because the carbon is more reactive than the metal and it can extract the metal from its salt this is um, in this reaction the metal is reduced is reduced as it loses oxygen and the carbon is oxidized because it gains oxygen because carbon will be changed from carbon into carbon dioxide. This is an example of the extraction of the metal from its oxide using carbon. And also metals which are above a carbon in the reactivity series can be extracted in a different way because now we cannot use carbon for the extraction of the metal because the carbon is less reactive than the metal. In this case, we need to use electrolysis. Few metals are um, very unreactive and they actually exist on Earth as pure form. Example of that is gold. So gold exists on Earth as pure gold and it can be simply uh, uh, extracted from Earth as uh, elemental gold. So what is electrolysis? The different way of extracting metals which are above the um, carbon and the reactivity series. React electrolysis means splitting by, elec uh, by electricity. In electrolysis, we need to have two electrodes, an anode, which is the positive electrode, and then a cathode, which is the negative electrode. And we know, need to immerse the two electrodes in an electrolyte. An electrolyte is a substance or um, a liquefied substance that has um, 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 that has the um, ions that can actually conduct the electricity and we need a source of uh, electric current. So when the electric current run, we have the different ions in the electrolyte. We have the negative ions. The negative ions will travel towards the anode, the anode um, to, uh, towards the anode, which is the positive electrode. In this case, the ions, the negative ions will be oxidized because they're going to lose electricity. Uh, at the cathode, the positive ions will then travel towards the cathode because the cathode is the negative electrode and then they will gain electrons so they will be reduced. So this is a redox reaction on at both electrodes. So well, there are two types of electrolysis that we can do. The first one is electrolysis of molten ionic solids, and the second one is the electrolysis of aqueous solution. So let's start off by electrolysis of molten ionic solids. So ionic solids, in, um, when they are um, in their solid state, they cannot conduct electricity. They, we cannot, they don't act as electrolytes. The reason for that is because the uh, uh, ions are tightly held together in 
in the solid form, and there you cannot move um, toward the electrode, uh, the both the different electrodes. So they need to be uh, melted before we actually conduct the electrolysis. So molten ionic compounds can be electrolyzed and the ions are free to move. An example of that, if we have, a, we do electrolysis of a molten sodium chloride. So in this case, we have the positive ions, which are the sodiums, they will move toward the cathode and then they will be reduced to give the elemental sodium. And then the towards the, the negative ions, which are the chloride ion, will travel towards the anode, the positive electrode, and they will be oxidized and they will lose electrons. An example, practical example of the um, use of electrolysis to extract metal from their old from their ores is the extraction of aluminium from the aluminium oxide. So in this um, type of electrolysis, we need to have two electrodes where the um, an anode will be a carbon anode and we have the carbon um, lining uh, of the vessel, which is the cathode in this case. And then we have the uh, molten aluminium uh, solution, aluminium oxide. So aluminium oxide itself is very has a very high temperature and very difficult to melt. So uh, the, they are first mixed with cryolite in order to lower its melting point. And then in the solution, when we start by putting the electric current, we have the aluminium ions. The aluminium ions are the positive ion. They will travel toward the cathode and they will be reduced to give the elemental aluminium. The molten aluminium here will collect at the bottom. And then we're going to have the oxygen ions. The oxygen will then travel toward the anode and they will be oxidized by losing electrons to give the oxygen. And this is the um, ionic equation for the extraction of the aluminium from its ore. Remember the um, state symbol. So aluminium oxide is a liquid because it's molten. That will give you the aluminium, which is liquid as well because it's molten, and then oxygen as a gas. What about the electrolysis of aqueous solution? There are two things that we need to consider. The first thing that in aqueous solution, we don't only have the ions from the salt of the metal, we also have the ions from water because this is aqueous solution. So we have hydrogen and we have hydroxide. Now you're gonna have two different uh, negatively charged species and two different positively charged species that will be competing for the oxidation and reduction at both the anode and the cathode and there will be some competition and not all the uh, ions will be oxidized or reduced. So let's have a look to understand more which one will be oxidized or reduced. So at the cathode, which is the negative electrode, if the metal ion comes from a metal that is more reactive than the hydrogen, higher up in the reactivity series, like sodium, lithium, or potassium, then the hydrogen will be reduced instead of the metal ion. So hydrogen gas will be reduced at, produced at the cathode, not the metal uh, itself. However, if we if the metal ion comes from a metal which is less reactive than the hydrogen, then this metal ion is the one that will be reduced at the cathode because it's going to gain the electron now. So if you have something like copper, the copper is the one that is going to be reduced and it will coat the cathode. At the anode, here there is the oxidation reaction and there will be competition between the negatively charged ions and the hydroxide ion. So if we have halogens or halides like chloride, bromide and iodide with the hydroxide, they will actually be the one that going to, the halide are going to be the one that will be oxidized at the anode. So here in this case, if you have any halide, you're going to end up with the halogen. But if you have any other ion which is not halide, like sulfate, um, like any other ion, then in this case, the hydroxide is the one that is going to be oxidized at the anode. And in this case, it will give you oxygen and will give water. 
So let's have some examples of electrolysis of uh, aqueous solution. So electrolysis of carbon sul uh, copper sulfate solution. So in copper sulfate, we have two, uh, four different ions, hydrogen, hydroxide, copper, and sulfate. So at the cathode, we have the copper and the hydrogen. And we know that copper is less reactive than hydrogen. So this is the one that is going to um, actually be reduced at the cathode. And it will be um, uh, lining the uh, our coat the cathode um, electrode and then at the anode we don't have any halide here we have the sulfate and the hydroxide so the hydroxide is the one that is going to be oxidized at the anode and in this case the hydroxide will give you oxygen and water Sodium chloride is another example. In sodium chloride, we have two um, uh, ions from the sodium chloride itself, which is sodium and chloride, and we have the hydrogen and hydroxide from the water. At the cathode, we have the sodium more reactive than the hydrogen, so the hydrogen is the ion that is going to be reduced at the cathode, and that will give us the, the um, hydrogen, um, the hydrogen gas at the cathode. At the anode, we have the halide and we have the hydroxide. The halide will then um, be uh, oxidized at the anode that will give us the chlorine instead of the oxygen and water and then the solution will have sodium and hydroxide remaining this topic also covers the pH scales and different acids and um, bases. So what is a pH scale? A pH scale is a measure of how acidic uh, and or basic a solution is. So there is a scale of a pH between 1 and 14. pH 7 means that the solution is neutral. It's not acidic or basic. And then if the pH is between 1 and less than 7, then this is an acidic solution. The lower the value, the higher the acidity of the solution. And then the value between more than 7 um, until 14, that means the solution is basic. And the bigger the value of the pH, that means it's more basic. So how can we measure the pH of the solution? The first method we can use is by using an indicator. There are two types of indicators. There is the indicator, a single indicator, which is a dye that can change its color depending on whether it's above or below a certain pH. So there are three different types of indicators, single indicators that you need to know. The first one is litmus, which gives you a red color in acidic solutions and blue color in alkali alkaline solutions. Solutions, phenolphthalein, which is colorless in acidic solution, and pink in alkali solution, and then methyl orange, which is red in acidic solution and yellow in alkaline solution. There is also what is called the um, uh, which is uh, called the universal indicator. And the universal indicator is a mixture of different dyes, which will give different colors at different pH. So you can test or give a rough estimation of the pH by using this um, universal indicator, which will give you a certain color at a certain pH. This is a good estimation of the pH value. To uh, specifically and accurately measure the pH of the solution, you can use the pH meter. In the pH meter, there is a pH probe, which can be immersed in your solution. And then the, there is a digitalization. It's a digital process where you can have a screen that will give you the exact value of the pH. Now moving on to talk about acid bases and alkalis. So acids are these uh, substances which will give you pH less than seven. They will form hydrogen ions in water. Example of that is hydrogen chloride. Bases will neutralize the acid. They normally uh, will give you pH. Uh, if they are in water, they will give you pH less uh, more than seven. Uh, they normally tend to neutralize the acid and bases will react with the acid to give salt. So there is another type of basis or a specific type of basis called alkalis. So alkalis are a type of basis, but they um, they are this type of bases which will give hydroxide ions in solution, in aqueous solution or in water. So they still react with acid or neutralize acid to give you salt and water. So all alkalis are bases, but not all bases are, are alkali. And we will see examples of these. 
Neutralization reaction is the reaction, reaction between acids and bases to give salt and water. So hydrogen ion from the acid and the hydroxide from the alkali will give you the water. An indicator can be used to show that a neutralization reaction, um, uh, that there is a neutralization reaction or when we reach the neutralization po point. This is because when the reaction is over, the pH will change and then the indicator will change the color which will give you an indication of the completion of the neutralization reaction. You can also use the pH probe or the pH meter to determine the pH of your solution. So acids will produce hydrogen ion in water and uh, examples of that hydro hydrochloric acid, nitric acid and sulfuric acid, all of these will produce the hydrogen ion in water. There are two types of acid. There is, uh, some acids are called the strong acids, others are called the weak acids. So strong acids like hydrogen chloride, nitric acid and sulfuric acid, they will ionize completely in water to give the hydrogen ion and the negative ions. Weak acids, however, like ethanoic acid, carbonic acid, and citric acid will not completely ionize. They will only partially be ionized in water. So while some of the acid will be ionized to give the hydrogen ion, the hydrogen and the negative ions will then react in a reversible reaction to give you the intact acid again. So they are not completely ionized in water, and this is why they are called weak acids. So acids and pH. So the pH is a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration. So uh, for every one unit decrease in the pH uh, on the pH scale, the concentration of the hydrogen ion will increase by a factor of 10. So a factor, factor of the hydrogen ion concentration change will always be 10 to the power x, where x is the change in the pH on the pH scale. So if we change the pH from 5 to 2, then that means that the solution is more acidic now. That means the concentration of the hydrogen ion has increased by a factor of 10 to the power 3 or by 1000. The pH of a strong acid will always be lower than the pH of a weak acid if these two have the same concentration. That will bring us to a very important point, which is the difference between a strong acid and concentrated acid. So what is the difference between these two? The acid strengths, which means weak or strong acid, will give us the uh, or reflect or indicate whether an acid has been completely ionized in aqueous solution or partially ionized. However, the concentration of an acid, which is either concentrated concentrated acids or weak acids will be a measure of how much of, um, of the acid is there in a certain volume of the solution. So an acid can be strong and dilute or can be strong and concentrated or weak and dilute or weak and concentrated. The larger the amount of the acid in the solution means it's more concentrated and then the pH will decrease if the concentration of the acid increases regardless whether it's a weak acid or a strong acid. So always there is an increase and a decrease in the pH because there is a decrease in the hydrogen ion concentration if the concentration of the acid increases. So what about bases? So bases, we have the alkalis and we have the bases. So let's distinguish between these two and see some examples. So water soluble metal oxides and metal hydroxides are alkalis. They are bases and they are alkalis. They will dissolve in water to give hydroxide ion, like sodium oxide with water will give you sodium hydroxide. So the sodium hydroxide will give you the hydroxide ion in the solutions. This reaction will react with acids in a neutralization reaction to give salt and water. However, insoluble metal oxides and metal hydroxides are still bases, but they are not alkalis because they do not dissolve in water and so they will not give you the hydroxide ion in water. But still, they can react with acids and they can neutralize acid to give you salt and water. These are some examples of neutralization reaction between uh, metal hydroxides or metal oxides and acids to give you the salt and water. 
Non-metal oxides are acidic. They are not basic. So this is very important thing to note. Examples of non-metal oxides are sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxide. These, when they dissolve in water, they will give you acidic solution. They will give you acids like nitrogen oxide with water will give you nitric acid. So non-metal oxides are acidic and they are not basic. Another example of bases are the metal carbonate. They are not alkalis, they are just bases because metal carbonate can react with acids in neutralization reaction to give you salt, water, and carbon dioxide. Example of that is sodium carbonate when react with hydrogen chloride or calcium carbonate when react with sulfuric acid that will give you the salt, water, and carbon.